Charles Duhigg is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and the author of Smarter, Faster, Better, covering the science of productivity, as well as the author of The Power of Habit, regarding the science of habit formation in our lives, companies, and societies. His latest book, Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection, comes out on February 20th, 2024. I'm definitely going to be grabbing a copy. Charles currently writes at the New Yorker magazine and until a few years ago was a reporter at the New York Times. This is the Counterculture Mom Show. I'm your host, Tina Griffin. We are honored to have you join us today as we address the topic of habits with reporter at the New Yorker, Charles Duhigg. Charles, how you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me on. Habits, New Year. There's habits we want to keep and keep rolling with it and uh, get deeper with. And there's habits we absolutely want to break. And then once again, they say after the first two or three weeks of the year, you'll see the gym go from max capacity to half capacity to like minimal by February. Yeah. You're going to help us stay with it. Um, tell me, Charles, habit is one of those words we hear constantly, but we never really stop to think about what that actually means. What is a habit exactly? So a habit as I, is, a, is a decision that we have made at some point that we stop making the decision, but continue acting on it, right? So at some point, you decided to whether to go for a run in the morning, or at some point, you decided whether to have dessert or to uh, say a morning prayer or meditate. And, and at some point, that decision stopped occurring, but you continued with the behavior, it became automatic. The thing about a habit is that we tend to focus on the behavior. But actually what we've learned is that if we can identify the cue and the routine and every habit in our life, about 70% of what we do every day is a habit. If wow. we can identify the cue and the routine, then we can actually change those, play with those in order to make, to create a new, a new behavior. That is so phenomenal. And now it's a matter of just applying what you just said, but that's, and it's very applicable. It's, it's very easy to, I think, easy to do if you stick with it. Yeah. Um, how much of our daily activities are influenced by habits? You said 70%? Yeah, yeah. So there's been a number of studies, particularly by a woman named Wendy Wood, who's now a professor at the University of Southern California. And what she has discovered is that about 70% of what we do every day feels like a decision, but it's actually not. It's something that's happening automatically. Uh, for instance, imagine when you back your car out of the driveway, right? You can probably do it on autopilot right now. You hardly right. even think about it. But at some point, it was really hard, right? That's because it's become a habit. There's become a cue and a reward associated with it. Now, you might not be thinking about that reward, but your brain knows that when you make the car, when you get the car successfully into the street without hitting the sidewalk or anything else, uh -huh. that there's a little part of your brain that goes, yippee, we succeeded. <laughs> and that reward is all it takes to make that behavior into a habit. And, and anyone can make any behavior into a habit if they just approach it the right way. Unreal. Okay, I have to ask, what got you on this habit trail? Were you like five or six years old? Are you like a type A person? We have everything lined up and it drives you crazy no. to see other people not have habits that are proper? I Actually, it's interesting because my, my new book, The Super Communicators, is coming out. And in some ways, it's the same thing. The power, the, what drove me to the power of habit is the same thing that drove me to super communicators, which is I had this basic question, which is if I am so smart, right? If I'm so good and successful, why is it so hard for me to lose like 15 pounds? Like, why do I struggle so much with getting up in the morning to exercise? And so I wanted to go ask experts, like, what do I need to know to make me better at this activity? And similarly, when it came to super communicators, the, I had a similar sort of experience, which is that I, there were all these times that I'd have trouble communicating with my wife and I couldn't figure out why, or I'd be at work and I was doing everything right, but the communication part. And as a result, everything fell apart. And so at some point I was like, look, there's experts I can ask about this. I'm going to write a book because that way the experts will talk to me. And that's where it came from. Okay. Do you have a chapter in your book that deals with the communication between husband and wife? Because if so, I got to yes. print that off and frame it. Okay. You absolutely. You, you want me to tell you what the secret is? Can you please tell me the secret? A couple absolutely. of bullet points because it's coming up on Valentine's Day and I want to be able to go on a date with my husband smiling and holding hands. <laughs> so here's, here's the problem I had that might be similar to the problem you had. So I would come home from work after a long and tough day and I would start complaining to my work, my wife about like my boss is a jerk and my coworkers don't appreciate me. And then she would respond with this very practical advice. She'd say, why don't you take your boss out to lunch and get to know each other a little bit better? And, and then, you know, and instead of hearing her, 
I would get even more upset. I'd be like, no, I want you to have my side. I want you to like support me and be outraged on my Validate. behalf. Validate. Exactly. So I went to all these experts and I asked them and they said, look, here's the mistake you're making. You're thinking of a conversation as one thing, but just like a habit has three parts, every conversation is actually made up or every discussion is actually made up of three different kinds of conversations. Wow. There's a practical conversation, which is about like making decisions together. There's an emotional conversation, which is about how we feel. There's a social conversation, which is about how we relate to other people. And I was coming in and I was having an emotional conversation and my wife was responding with a practical conversation. <laughs> That's a recipe for miscommunication and disaster. A disaster. We, once we learn to match each other, that's when all of a sudden we began hearing each other a lot better. Okay. So does, problem, that, does that apply to your life? Oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. I, it's Absolutely. The only thing that makes me uh, my blood boil a little bit here is I'm kind of frustrated that that book isn't in my hands immediately. we got to wait about <laughs> two more weeks here, buddy. Unbelievable. It is coming out. We're going to talk more about your book. So don't go anywhere, Charles. More with Charles and communication, habits, and all the rest right after this. We're a well-funded Christian entertainment company that's making world-class games for children. And what we're doing is unique because we're building top-notch gaming content that competes with the top of the stuff on the App Store, but that contains God's truth. Whether it's games that are biblical or games that come out of a new world we've created called the Rimverse. I was looking out at the world and I got bothered by a few things. Anxiety, suicide, and depression rates are all-time highs for children which exactly parallels the rise of social media on smartphones. I noticed that for the first time in American history, less than half of Americans go to church. While over 60% of people in this country over 40 believe in God, that for children, well, it's only 32%. As a parent, and I'm a parent, and there's a lot of parents out there that we hear this from that want the true play solution, there's nowhere they can take their kids to deliver them high quality entertainment, something that they're actually gonna enjoy and use, but that also contains God's truth that contains the values that they hold dear. Head over to TruePlayGames.com to learn more. The Jace case is a pack of five antibiotics. We put these antibiotics together very purposefully. They were curated in a way that covers the most common as well as the most deadly bacterial infections that you might encounter. In addition, it includes a guidebook to the safe use of the medications that is written in a way that's accessible for most people to be able to look up what their symptoms are and what the proper medication is to take. The idea behind the Jace case is to allow everyone to be better prepared medically, to be empowered to care for themselves. Since the pandemic began, our healthcare industry has had to transform from receiving medication to physician visits. Everything changed. Jace Medical is dedicated to providing proper access to medications before you need them. This protects against issues during travel or disruptions with supply chains, natural disasters, and other emergency situations that have proven to overwhelm our healthcare system. Secure your own supply of medication with ease and peace of mind. Use code TINA for a discount at jacemedical.com. Charles, new year, hopefully new us. Um, tell us, how can we change our habits? If habits are so prevalent and so insidious, how do you go about even changing them? Okay, so there's a couple of steps here. The first is to figure out what is that cue and that reward. So let's take you, for instance. What is a habit you have that you would like to change? Me personally? Yeah. I'm like wondering which one's okay for TV. Uh, let's, do, <laughs> let's do impatience. Okay. Okay. That's I a great one. I need to be one. more patient. Now, now the normal way that we would do this, that the nat, the the instinctual way would be to say, I need to, I need to get rid of impatience. So therefore, I should just extinguish it. I should just press it down, repress it, and be more patient. But we've tried that. That doesn't work, doesn't right? Doesn't work. So let's figure out the cue and the reward. So when you find last time you were impatient, what set it off? I would say. Um, Usually, whoever I'm impatient with, it's because I had asked them or we discussed 57 times in the last three months the exact same situation. I'm ready for a new problem to solve. Come out. Yeah. Okay. So repetition, right? When yes. you see the same problem over and over and it doesn't feel like it's getting better, that's your cue to get impatient. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say, so what do you do? Do you, do you yell at the person? Do you just sort of stew in your own frustration? How does that, how does it manifest itself? Um, usually outward and it depends what it is and who it's with. Yeah, <laughs> a yeah. kid, I'm like, come on, we talked about this 500 times in the last two weeks, you know, and then 
maybe sometimes a penalty or I'll give them a scrubber to scrub out the toilet. I'll find something depending on how I feel at the moment. So let's use that. Let's use that. Okay. So you're talking to your kid and you're saying, come on, you're driving, you're making me nuts here, which I do all the time myself. How do you feel afterwards? What reward is that delivering to you? Okay. So let's say wet towels on the bathroom floor. It drives me nuts. I talk about the mold. I do exaggerate and say there's going to be, you know, they could die of some (laughs) kind of mold infestation just to have them hopefully get it this time. It gets worse every time I talk about the wet towel. And there's not just one, there's usually seven around, scattered around the house because we have a lot of kids. Right. Everyone has the same problem. Um, how do I feel after I tell them, are you kidding me? Um, I feel bad because I got frustrated and I was impatient. So my reward was not good. Thank you for walking me through this um, live with America problem. <laughs> I, I like being the victim. It's actually fun. I'm getting some answers. So I don't feel so, good so, after that happens. So- so I would suggest that I think probably two things are happening here. You're exactly right. You're you're blaming yourself for not bringing your best instinct to but at the same time there's part of you that says this time it's going to it's going to finally penetrate. This time if I do this enough they're going to pick up those towels and I'm going to put them on the hooks so they won't be on the ground. And there's a little bit of part little part of your brain that says like you know what? I feel like a responsible parent. Like this is what a parent is supposed to do. Even though it wasn't successful, I feel bad about not being the perfect parent. Parent, I feel like I'm an okay parent because I did this. And that's a reward. So let's let's change that habit. And the key here is to think about how do we keep the old cue, keep something similar to the old reward, but change the routine, change the behavior. So okay, So next time you walk into your kid's room, there's like five wet towels on the floor. You're like, how did you even use five towels? And one, I don't even understand. You turn to them. What would you prefer to say? Like, what do you think would be the right thing to say? I'll use Jake, the oldest, which he should set the standards high. He's the one with the most wet towels. I I would be like, Jake, do you see anything in this room? Let's do I spied. What do you see in this room that, you know, it shouldn't probably, what does not belong in this scenery? Because here's what's really hard for me to do. Jake, son, I love you dearly. I know I told you so many times before, but I know that you got a lot in your plate. There's a towel that's (laughs) oozing out two gallons of water. I don't have a calm voice to begin with. I have like a command voice. So it sounds really cheesy if I use the lighter, nicer voice. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Let's say, let's say we said, okay, this is called an implementation intention. Let's say the next time you walk into Jake's room, you see the wet towel, you say to him, I'd like you to look around and tell me what's bothering me. Right? Oh, that's That's, that's, good. that's, that's okay. a little bit nicer. And then, then something's going to happen. Either Jake's going to see that towel and he's going to pick it up on his own. Or he's not going to see that towel. And even if he doesn't see that towel, that's okay because you were just a good parent. You just did a good thing as a parent. You taught him to teach himself. And if you give yourself that reward, if you let yourself enjoy that reward, that new behavior, it's going to become more and more ingrained until it feels automatic. And you're walking into Jake's room and you're not just talking about his towels. You're talking about his clothes on the ground. You're talking about like all the stuff he hasn't put away, like three years worth of like sports equipment. And instead, and it's just going to be automatic for you to say, Jake, look around. Tell me what I'm thinking about that. I wish I wish was different about this room. That really sounds so much nicer. And honestly, sometimes too, I'll be like, hey, you know how you can take care of stuff. And it's not just because mom says it. I let him know we worked hard to get it for you with God's money. How does God want you to honor him with how you're responsible for these items? And then I will say, if you want to go to your friend's house, do a sleepover, game night, whatever, not, it'll probably be a yes. If you took care of your stuff and you were responsible throughout the week. And then I have to also, that, that is working. We've implemented that, even though it's not like hundred percent, we're getting better. And then I am trying to really notice what he does do well or each kid does Mm -hmm. well to reward them and say, good job. I noticed you did X, Y, Z, because then I notice they are conscious to do it more often. I'm trying. And and that's really good. And trying is what matters most. And, And there's a lot of ways to do this. There's been a lot of research, for instance, when a kid comes home with great grades, if you say to them, oh, my gosh, you did so good this semester, you're really smart. That's that's not as effective as saying to them, oh my gosh, you got great grades. You must have worked really hard this semester. Because in the second thing, saying you're worked hard, what we're doing is we're saying, I'm rewarding you 
for your struggle, for your effort. I'm not rewarding you for a characteristic, right? Like you're right. smart, you're not smart, who knows? But you worked hard. That's something you can control. I and this really is a big like part that. of Yeah, this is a big part of communication is that when when we are communicating with other people and we think a little bit more about how we're praising them, how we're complimenting them, how we're giving them the love back, right? It, it matters a lot in how we see ourselves. And, and you mentioned, you know, bringing up God and bringing up prayer. That's an important part of how we communicate with each other is to, to say, look, we share these values and, it, and we live those values by picking our towels up from off the ground. Yeah. And then fill in the blank for everything else. But I know it'll, it'll just happen over time. Plus, I know that each person in the house has different giftings. Like we're good at certain things and we're not good at certain things. I'm like really organized. So it bugs me more when I see an organization, but then they might be more patient. I have to work on my patience. So it's a matter of just realizing that we all have to look, kind of work together. And then it's also tough. I grew up in a house where I know my parents love me. But my dad did not really acknowledge a lot of stuff that I did. He kind of was like just a, kind of a workaholic. So he wasn't really like... It, involved with my life a lot and so it's tough to give our kids what we might have not received ourselves Absolutely. it's such a learning curve because we learned those habits from our parents right yeah we, we learned now I, i'll give you a, something that i've used that i think has been pretty effective which is <clears throat> and this this again i mentioned there's these three types of conversations right the practical the emotional and the social what, this is something that they've taught in schools is that when a kid comes up and they have a problem or something they want to say, the teacher oftentimes starts the conversation by saying, okay, before you start, do you want to be helped? Do you want to be heard? Or do you want to be hugged? That's and really the nice thing good. about that, those are the three kinds of conversations, right? The wow. practical, the, the emotional, and the social. And the reason why that's useful is because then the kid tells you what they need. That's like so what, good. And, and I think to your point with your dad, like imagine if your dad had come up and said to you, look, before we talk about whatever it is you want to talk about or I want to talk about, do you want to be helped, heard, or hugged? You would have been able to say to him, dad, like what I need, what I need sometimes is your help. I need you to help me solve a problem. But sometimes I just need you to give me a hug. Yeah. And once again, knowing his parents' situation, they never hugged. And so yeah. it's so tough. It's like you want to give grace to the previous generation because – they might need it. It's your information today is just life-saving for me. It really oh, is. Thank you. It makes me look at, um, calm down and look at, it could be worse. And the issues that I'm dealing with right now in the house, I have to remind myself, my kids are healthy. You know, there's families right now that lost children where their children are even disabled. Um, they lost, you know, in utero pregnancy, like a lot of other yeah. lost jobs. There's a lot of other more serious things, but at the same time, you want to try to teach our kids to be responsible, but not type A on steroids, but sometimes I can be. So <laughs> I tell you what, this 2024, it's going to be like, what can counterculture mom work on? And America's going to watch it happen. Here we go, people. Be on the journey with me. Help me. Help. Email us at show at counterculturemom.com and let me know I'm not the only one trying to improve my life. That'll help me feel a little better. Good. You. And you tell me what you learn and I'll use it in my life too. I, I bet you will. And the blogs and the books and your radio programs. I, I bet. <laughs> How can building good habits positively impact the people around us? Oh my gosh. In so many ways, right? I mean, you just talked about impatience. When we're more patient with our kids, they learn self-control. When we eat more healthily, automatically, when we make eating vegetables just a part of every single meal, yes. then they grow up to eat vegetables every night. On the other hand, if you have dessert after every meal every single night, they're going to grow up thinking, oh, dessert is what you have after dinner. And and for some people, that's okay. But for some people, it's not. The way, look, the truth of the matter is, what you say to your kid one day, you take the most, the most, um, you take that conversation that you remember in your head, the one that you really felt like you connected with your kid, they're going to remember that, but they're going to remember a thousand other conversations too. Excellence is not about what you do today. It's about what you do every day. Yes, and so when good. we do it every day, our children learn, this is the habit I should emulate. This is who I should be. You, you know, you talk about, about, you know, religious faith. Imagine if somebody came to you and they said, you only have to pray once in your entire life. <laughs> that there's that's there's no you don't get any of the rewards of faith if they do that. It's because it becomes a daily or a weekly practice and devotion 
that it brings some grace into our lives. I'm going to grab a cookie during this commercial break to feel a little bit better after you just cracked that whip. More with Charles and his phenomenal books right after. The following is a life-saving message brought to you by LifeVac. Hi, I'm Arthur Lee, CEO and inventor of the LifeVac. Did you know that over 30 children a day are rushed to the hospital due to a choking emergency? That's why it's imperative to have a LifeVac nearby. It's made in the USA. LifeVac is an emergency suction device that is patented, FDA registered, and has successfully saved over a thousand lives already. Hear it from a real life saved. I tell people LifeVac saved my baby. I had the skills, I had the training, it didn't work. The LifeVac is simple to use. Just place, push and pull to suction the object from the airways. Avoid the ER or worse. Get your life-saving LifeVac now. Choking emergencies happen. Get your very own LifeVac now and get 20% off. Visit LifeVac.net or call 877-LIFEVAC now. Charles, everybody has to grab, I want to say a chocolate chip cookie, but what the heck, (laughs) one chocolate chip cookie after going to the gym and sit down and read your book. You have a couple of them that are out there right now. The new book coming out in February is called Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection. How can we connect with others when we have deep personal disagreements? I want to talk to you about that as well. Is that in that book and where can we find your book? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's coming out in February. You can pre-order it now at Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or Target or Walmart, wherever you buy books. Um, You can find it online and pre-order it. And if you if you do pre-order it um, and let me know, I will send you a signed book plate that you can put inside the book because it's I so appreciate people pre-ordering. And and the basic message behind this is that there are these people who are super communicators, right, who seem to connect with everyone. But the truth of the matter is, all of us have the capacity to be super communicators. It's not like an inborn skill. It's a, it's something that we learn. It's a, it's a tool that we can develop. The key is to understand how communication works. CharlesDuhigg.com, D-U-H-I-G-G.com. Charles, <laughs> you are a blessing. Thank you for jumping on the program today. Everybody, you have to watch all four episodes this week as we dissect habits, which ones to keep and which ones to ditch in the new year, 2024. Happy New Year, everybody. You rock. Keep up the excellent work. And if you're ever in Nashville, make sure you look me up. Come on over. I absolutely will. You talked me into it. Take it easy, everybody. CounterCultureMom.com. Watch all four episodes and share away. Thanks for joining us for the Counterculture Mom Show with your host, Tina Griffin. For over two decades, Tina has traveled the globe exposing how pop culture is glamorizing harmful behaviors without showing the consequences and how these messages are wreaking havoc on today's youth. Through radio, TV, podcasts, and our app, Counter Culture Ministries is reaching millions every week with a biblically-based message for hope for today's teens and their parents. But we can't do that without your faithful prayer and financial investment. If you appreciate the ministry of Tina and Counterculture Ministries, would you prayerfully consider a generous gift right now? We have a donor matching dollar for dollar. You can give securely online by visiting counterculturemom.com or by texting the word DONATE to the number 55444. That's counterculturemom.com or text the word DONATE to the number 55444. Every dollar is doubled. If you love this show, you can stay up to date on the latest critical issues affecting your family by catching all of our weekly episodes with resource links, signing up for our e-newsletter, and downloading our Counterculture Mom app, where you get timely pop culture alerts. Visit CounterCultureMom.com for more details. And be sure to join us next week for another edition of the Counterculture Mom Show with Tina Griffin, where we are rewriting Hollywood script for our kids. 